Any of the champions, so like obviously from any anywhere in the world, they've stuck at it. They've been around a long time, especially like the the top level ones. So that they just haven't quit. Like I've I've known so many good fighters that probably could have become champion, but they just stopped. Now, like so I just think it's the discipline to keep going, keep you want to aim for that goal and not letting anything deter you from reaching that goal. Welcome to another episode of the Science of Building Champions podcast, where I chat with top level fighters and coaches and dive into their stories to discover what makes them champions. And today I have the honor to speak with Damien Trainer, former two times British champion, four times European champion, and two times world champion, who runs his own gym, K Star Legacy, just outside Birmingham in the UK. And it's much sought after around the world for his Muay Thai seminars. So I'm really pleased to have an opportunity to speak to him. Thanks for being here, Damien. No, that's great. Thanks for having me. <laughs> so, you, you know, you're, you're a guy who treads that line between, you know, a very, very competent fighter and now a coach as well. And it's not something that everyone's able to do. So I'm really excited to, to speak to you. And you've been in Muay Thai now for a long time. I mean, I think it's since you're 14 years old, wasn't it? Something like that? That's right, yeah. Yeah, I started um, when I was 14, which was in um, 1994. And, and what got you into Muay Thai? Why Muay Thai? especially at such a young age? Well, to be honest, um, the gym was literally down the road from our school. So I used to have to pass the gym frequently to get to school anyway. And then um, I said a couple of friends in my class that started training. They said, just come down, try it out. So I didn't kind of have any kind of big aspirations. I went in, I liked what I saw, and it just kind of carried on from there. So it was, it was straight in with Muay Thai as well, because, you know, in the UK, back in earlier times as such, um, Muay Thai, well, MMA definitely wasn't really around, but Muay Thai itself, I mean, I guess in Birmingham, there was a little bit more of a, a presence there, but generally it was traditional karate, taekwondo, all these kind of martial arts were going on, but you went straight into Muay Thai and it was literally just because it was something that was on hand for you down the road, was it? Yeah, that's it. Um, I think as well, uh, K-Star was like the, the only full-time gym in Birmingham at the time as well. So it was open seven days a week. Um, I can think of two others that were in the Birmingham area but I was still quite far from where I was and it, like I say it just literally it was just because it was on my doorstep yeah and being a full-time gym as well I mean there's there's lots of full-time gyms now it's become much more commonplace but back then in the 90s there were there were hardly any anywhere were there in the UK no there's nothing and I think um a lot of my coach Steve Logan first went to do it, everyone was telling him he was mad it would never work but obviously it's been going for like nearly 30 years full time so it's done all right. And as, you know, as a 14 year old, I mean, that kind of setup, being a full time gym and all those opportunities to train, and I guess the kind of people that it attracts around you as well, um, you very quickly cleaned up as a, as like a junior fighter, didn't you? And you very quickly, probably prematurely, had to go up to the, the adult ranks to, to get a challenge. Is that right? Yeah. Um, uh, but I had quite a few fights as a junior, and then um, I started fighting in the adult ranks when I was 16 just because I'd kind of done everything I could as a junior and it just kind of like the next kind of stage up from there. Um, my coach was kind of confident I wouldn't get smashed up against the adults because obviously I was in the classes anyway with them training. Um, then my first fight as an adult, uh, I stopped them in the second round and then um, obviously just kind of snowballed from there. Yeah. I mean, and having that kind of start in those adult fights did you very quickly decide you know that well i'd like to become a champion now i've got something here or, or was it something that took a while to evolve that that became your real target well, to be honest in the gym because so like now uh, i think almost every show has got a world title fight on the event so champions kind of back then were a bit more scarce and i've seen our gym we had quite a few midland area champions and we had like one british champion so to start with, as a junior, I thought I want to be Midland champion because obviously that's kind of like what I saw. And as um, I was getting closer to winning that as a, a junior, I was thinking, that's no, too small. I want to be British champion. And obviously after I'd won the uh, Midland area, and obviously coming up to the British, I kind of started, obviously, so I used to watch a lot of um, videos of like Roman Deckers and Rob Kamen and people like that. And I kind of thought, no, I want to, I want to get to there. So before I'd even got to the adult ranks, I'd kind of set my goal on, 
I want to become a world champion. And then as I kind of got closer to becoming a world champion, I kind of thought, you know what, I want to be remembered. So I'm sort of now I'm just trying to keep going a little bit past the title. The title's only kind of like one aspect you need to kind of focus on after the title as well, which I think a lot of fighters don't seem to do. Yeah. And do, do you know what that... My, my question that was coming up now is that transition from fighter having achieved what you've done to then coach, you know, how did that come about? And you've kind of, you've tipped into that there about being remembered. And is that, is that what the coaching is all about now? Um, I suppose so. But um, I kind of worked part time in a gym from when I was 15. So, so like with my, with my trainer, he didn't only teach me Muay Thai, he taught me how to teach as well. So we've got like a real good, um, style at k style because we know how to converse you know how to explain things know how to break things down and obviously we understand not everybody learns the same way so you need to have four or five different methods of how to explain the same thing so i might say something to you you don't get it but they do so i need to kind of change it up for you change it up for them and obviously i've just i've been taught that as well as the actual fighting side of things so teaching's just kind of done what i've done since i've left school <laughs> it's just naturally evolved that, yeah. I tell you what, that that the way that you you coach or you teach, I mean, it comes across in the posts that you put online as well. You know, in the way that you break down things, there's, there's thought process behind it. Everything you sort of there, there very much is that justification for why you're doing it a certain way. That that would, it's not just telling people what to do. It's kind of understanding the why behind it. And that's even even with what you write, you you you're very good at coaching, from what I can see. You know. Um, so that is, you can see it's ingrained in you. And I, I want to come back to to your sort of coaching there because I think that's excellent the way you, you go about that. Um, okay. But what what is it now, sort of rewinding, um, what is it that you love and appreciate appreciate a, about Muay Thai itself as, as a sport right from the start? Um, I think a lot of people when they first kind of view it, they probably might think it's a bit barbaric, it's a bit violence but when you kind of sit down and have a look at it properly it's a very clever game and then obviously it's all about outthinking each other and um like obviously on a lot of the posts that i put i'll get like a few crazy comments it's like people don't fully understand that for one thing to work it's been set up by four or five different steps prior to it which is what i find fascinating in what's going on in all combat sports once you know what you're looking for you can see someone trying to work something to work later on in the fight if that makes sense yeah sowing a seed and, and waiting for that to, to be yeah. taken that that's something i've really enjoyed about the the stuff that you have been sharing online is that um i mean you, you mentioned like uh, raymond deckers and the, the sort of dutch style and and you you very much kind of pull that into what you do as well don't you with your combinations yeah um when obviously before i first started out which is obviously the, the 90s um it's very hard to get hold of anything from Thailand. But obviously, you could get hold of stuff from Europe. Um, I don't know if you remember Screen Sport. Remember Screen oh, Sport? Yes. Yeah. Sky? So, obviously, that they used to have quite a lot of Muay Thai on that. But obviously, it was Holland, so it was the Dutch fighters. So that was quite prevalent over here. And then, if you looked at Muay Thai in the 90s in the UK, it was very Dutch style. Then it kind of started to transition a little bit more in the early 2000s mid 2000s so it gets a bit more more Thai orientated and obviously now it's very Thai style so obviously I kind of grew up to start with with the Dutch style then I've kind of had to evolve with the sport as it's gone on in this country otherwise with that one style I wouldn't have won if it was just unless it was by knockout so I had to kind of adapt between the two which is where I find I can switch quite quickly to a very traditional tie or what people class as a traditional tie and obviously a Dutch style. Is that almost like that switch? Is it, is it like a binary switch that you've got in your head that you almost kind of go Thai style and Dutch style or sort of more combinations? Is, is that kind of I mean, a kind flick of, in your head? Um, yeah, it will kind of like, um, but obviously some stuff just flows out naturally where I'll just start some off and it will just come out, which obviously just comes from the repetitions that I do. Cause like I say, um, like obviously you know yourself you don't think oh you know what i'm gonna go jab cross hook then i'm gonna follow the kick then you'll literally you'll throw the first shot you'll see oh he's open there then you'll just kind of flow with what's available to you but obviously the stuff that you keep drilling is what's going to come out yeah and, that, and your drills your drills are a big part of what you do and i think that's that's something that i've 
believe is kind of underutilized to the extent that you do with a lot of people with this repetition to to be able to tap into some flow so there's just some autonomous stuff that comes out without you thinking that almost i kind of like i like the analogy that it's it's more about you adopt like an attitude at a certain time and then just what happens happens when you're there when you've adopted that attitude so yeah. almost whether it is like an aggressive attitude an elusive one or a tricky one or a counter one or whatever it's almost like rather than thinking about i'm going to do a specific combination it's almost you put yourself at a a, a range and with a certain attitude and what happens happens sometimes you are going to be very cognitively setting stuff up but quite often the best stuff just happens doesn't it no that's it like i say like um you might like i say say you throw a jab you'll notice that they parry so you think, okay so you parry so i'll hook he's blocked the hook i can go to the body you know like you just kind of look very quickly because obviously your brain works very fast so obviously you can see things very quickly and obviously you, you react to what's happening at the time and is that a big part of how you you train your fighters um in that sort of observation because I, I know some fighters are very kind of one way it's almost like they're on a walkie-talkie and they press transmit walkie-talkie that's an old reference isn't it yeah. <laughs> most of the kids are going what <laughs> but you had to press the button down to speak and he had to let go to let the other person speak back and it's almost like they, they're permanently pressing speak and they're just doing what they're doing and not observing what's coming back too much is that is that something you kind of drill in what you do those little periods of observe um i'm really i think i'm quite lucky with the group of people that i've got in the gym because i think obviously they respect what i'm saying because obviously I've, I've got the experience to kind of back it up and obviously generally when i say things they'll do it almost instantly so i'm kind of the one observing and obviously they're the ones that are just kind of reacting to what i'm saying but then i've got a few people that are quite high up like the like world champions themselves and obviously for them, they can kind of assess what's going on. And obviously when they come back to the corner, then I kind of say, oh, try and do this, try and do that. Like them, I can kind of almost leave a little bit to themselves kind of thing. Unless it's, obviously the fight gets very competitive, then I'll have to get like very involved. Yes. But I think it just comes down to experience. So the less experienced they are, I'm the one that kind of takes control. The more experienced they are, then I'll kind of help guide them rather than telling them what to do, if that makes sense. Yes. Yeah. It's there. Uh, it's, Letting the dog off the lead. Yeah. Thing. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, there's, there's been this evolution um, with Muay Thai. I mean, you've, you've seen it right from the pretty much the early days here in the UK. So what, what do you appreciate about Muay Thai now that you perhaps, that has it's evolved or things that you've noticed now compared to when you started out? I think the overall standard is far better now like everyone's uh, basics are very like everyone's very kind of almost polished whereas like before you'd get a handful of polished ones and obviously a lot of rough ones that just knew how to have a fight if that makes sense so mm. i just think the overall standard is better now but i kind of think that there was potentially more stars before than now does that make sense i don't know if that's because there's a large variety of better people now so it's harder for people to stand out i don't know or obviously like i said there's like you have a handful of really good ones and one's not so good said so stand out a little bit more um, I, I don't know but i just kind of thought there's people spoke about fighters more than like in the past and what they're doing now but like i said that just might be because there's so many good yeah. ones to pick from almost almost like the pool is a bit more diluted now the, yeah. the levels the levels good but yeah there's, there's more to sort of spread your attention around yeah yeah i mean um in, in to talking about your your fight career so you came out of retirement didn't you after about four years to, to have yeah, a fight um, as well i just only had it was a one-off um yeah. i wanted to just have a fight in front of my son that was it so yeah. like um to be honest as soon as i agreed the fight i kind of regretted it because I didn't want to train. I didn't want to, I didn't want to do anything. Cause obviously when you, as you know yourself, when you're trying to fight, you're going to be very selfish and obviously you've got to focus on you. Obviously I couldn't focus on me. So I've got a gym that pays my mortgage. I've got a family. I need to make sure that, you know, like, so it was just, it was just too hard to do. So yeah. it, it wasn't an enjoyable experience. I'm glad I got to fight in front of my son, but it just wasn't an enjoyable experience. Yeah, it was a little, little test just to see. I, I completely understand your reasons there. And also why you just thought, yeah, that's that's a one-off. 
because I know as, as soon as I started having a full time gym, that was where I like I was trying to fight at the same time. It just it was the kiss of death for that for me yeah. personally. I couldn't. I'd kind of had to put the energy where I needed to put it, and if you split it, it for for me it was just like no something's going to fall over. No, and that's it. And obviously, so like with the gym, the gym is your. Uh, staying relevant staying you know like that's this is what's going to set you up kind of like almost for the rest of your life if you do it properly whereas the fighting side it's a couple of years if that yeah yeah there's there's definitely a limited window there isn't there yeah um i, th- I think there's there's ways people can extend that that's with with their training i think there's a lot of methods actually that could be done better that wouldn't sort of wreck people quite so early but um do you think that boils down to the size of the person because obviously Death, people ask yeah. me like, well, why, why did I kind of, why don't I want to fight anymore? One, I don't want to, but two, because I'm so small, uh, my weights to come through weight. So I get all the 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, while they're growing to where they are, where if you've got someone who's in the seventies, mid 70 kilos, that's probably where they are, if that makes sense. So you, yes. not really, you get many 18, 19, 20, 21 year olds. Yes. Yeah. I see what you mean. There's that, that, that spectrum of growth. That so yeah. what, what, as in the, uh, what well, the injuries come because you're heavier. Yeah. So, so obviously, you um, you'd kind of said about, um, obviously certain ways of training. So obviously you get less injuries, so you can kind of take your fighting career a little bit longer. Would you say that the lighter you are, that's harder to do, or do you think it's the same? I think actually generally, if you're lighter, you don't tend to suffer as many injuries just because of the sort of self-destructive impact of your own body weight. Okay. So yeah, generally, I mean, it's the, it, all the, all the running as you get heavier, for example, it's all a lot more pounding on the joints and stuff and knees and hips and backs. And there's, there's all of that sort of side of it, but it, it's very much down to, um, f- for me, very much down to how robust your sort of, um, muscular system is around the, the joints themselves. So okay. if you're, so if you're, um, structurally sound so that you actually, in terms of like guy ropes, the, if the muscles are acting like guy ropes around all of the joints, if they're all pulling at the right tension, so it's keeping everything centered properly and stable rather than sort of banging into the joints every time you move, then you're going to last a lot longer. And I yeah. think that there's um, typically in a lot of martial arts and Muay Thai in particular, there's a lot of overuse of certain patterns and underuse of others that end yeah. up making you sort of tight and strong on one side and long and weak on the other, which kind of makes your joints slop the wrong way a bit and just wear prematurely. And especially if you're doing high volumes of training that aren't needed either, just to try and boost some fitness. There's a lot of um, adding more to try and make someone fitter rather than adding something different that taps into something that really um, lasers in on a specific adaptation rather than just sort of doing more of the same and wearing things out. So I I really think that the the fighters could last longer if if things were sort of managed better that way. But that's that's a kind of like parallel... Kind of supplemental training field really that of course yeah. is, the, is what i'm passionate about but um yeah it's really really interesting that you you're kind of noticing these things um sort of talking about um, champions as well though damien have, you know you've you've obviously been a champion yourself you're you've got tra- champions in your own gym you're, you're going off and working with other champions as well are there some common traits that you feel there are with the champion mindset compared to those that don't make it um, I think the, the main one is discipline. Is they're just they're there. So if you look at um, any of the champions, so like obviously from your, any anywhere in the world, they've stuck at it. They've been around a long time, especially like the the top level ones. So that they just haven't quit. Like so I've I've known so many good fighters that probably could have become champion, but they just stopped. And then obviously, I just think it's the discipline to keep going keep you want to aim for that goal and not letting anything deter you from reaching that goal yeah and it's if you've seen a lot i mean i've kind of got my own sort of views on this but of course with the sort of the the level of the people that you've seen and the volume of the people that you've seen have you seen a lot of people with a lot of sort of natural talent if you like for it but you just yeah. know then they're, they're nev- never going to actually become a champion yeah, like, like, um, so like the gym, like case style, obviously it, it's, it's been around for years and obviously we get a lot of members come through and there's been so many people that are so naturally talented 
and everyone keeps telling them, oh, you should fight, you should fight, but they never do. I don't know if it's because they're unsure of themselves and obviously they know they're good, but it will get tested in a proper fight then. And it might not go the way that they want. So I think it's their own fear sometimes that holds them back, if that makes sense. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. But then there's other things where uh, life gets in the way. You, you can't make a living out of it in this country. And some people that are very good, they end up having a child or they want to get a mortgage or they've got a career. It's not. So obviously for a lot of people, training it's just a hobby. It's not, it's not going to pay the bills for them. Yeah. There's always that, that balance, isn't there? Um, yeah. Perhaps one day there'll be there will be a big enough wage in it that everyone oh, could yeah. actually. Oh, that'd be lovely, wouldn't it? <laughs> At the moment, we're sort of just treading that line, though. Yeah. Um, is there when it when it comes to that sort of uh, the the person that's good who goes into the ring, they're they're kind of to use your words, they're potentially fearful of what's going to happen. Um, do you think that's down to to what they're their kind of internal motivation is or, or whether it's or internal or external really whether they're doing it really for their own purposes or whether they're doing it for that outward appearance and are more worried about what other people are thinking about it do you think there's, there's a there's a difference there in in attitude um i'd say there is i, I think if cause as you know sometimes a fight can get quite rough and you have to kind of dig deep and i think if you're not kind of doing it for your own purposes you might not be able to push through but if you're kind of thinking of other people you probably don't have that same desire to to break through it if that makes sense yeah yeah and, and like it, said, i've seen loads of people where like they're really good but then once it starts getting competitive they, they just can't can't handle it and i've said they'll kind of back down rather than digging deep and going forwards but then i think that kind of comes from a whole number of issues, but the main thing is like, is your overall goal at the end of it? Yeah. And is there anything that you tend to do in classes with fighters differently because of this mindset side, because of this real pressure when you do get into the ring? Um, or is it, is it more of a case of it's, you learn this almost like an apprenticeship by, by competing at a relevant level and you progress through and we, we kind of do it on fight days or is there anything you kind of look at in classes, for example? Um, like, so a lot of people having their, their first couple of fights, we'll, we'll kind of talk to them because um, if they've never had a fight, they probably don't know that they're going to be nervous. So you have to kind of say, oh, look, you're going to be nervous. You're going to be this, you're going to be that. Don't just kind of explain like what it is. Then after the first couple of fights, then you kind of know what they're like. Um, you know how they react. Like you, You'll get to know them better. You'll kind of know if you need to speak to them a little bit more on the psychological things or, does that make sense? Like yeah. you don't really know until about the first few fights that you know where you can kind of push them because everyone, everyone thinks that they can fight. Everyone thinks that when it kind of gets down to it, they can deal with it. But it's a big difference when it's actually in front of you and happening. Yeah, that yeah, the pressure test. That's yeah, and I, th I think that's. Do you know what? That's when one of the things I've really enjoyed personally about Muay Thai is that it is that test because you do think, oh, I'd behave like this in this circumstance, but um, you find out a lot about yourself, don't you, when you're fighting? Yeah. Yeah. So some people say that like, they don't think you do, but you really do find out about you, especially when it's a tough fight, then you really kind of know. Mm. And I think those, those habits are kind of mirrored in, in life I've noticed when, yeah, when people, are, when they, when they're pushed hard in, in training or in a fight, how they kind of respond to that. I tend to see those habits repeat in, in other areas of their life as well. Um, Cause when I'm, I was in Thailand, so I was, I was there for quite a while, basically just by myself. There wasn't really many people to kind of speak with and the people that you do speak most are acquaintances rather than friends. So you don't really gel in that aspect. So, so a lot of it was on my own and it gave me time to kind of reflect on my training to where the smallest thing that I probably got was the actual how to punch, how to kick, how to, but everything else that come along, obviously the confidence, goal setting, determination, you know, all that, I can take that. Well, obviously one, it made me go to a country that doesn't really speak my language with people I don't really know and stay there for quite a while. And obviously uh, just another, I like going for job interviews and driving tests, you know, like you can kind of, use those same qualities in all different areas of your life. 
Yeah, that being starting to become uncomfortable with being uncomfortable, but realizing you can deal with it, you can cope with it. And yeah, really, what's the worst that's going to happen? You kind of fail in some way, but it's it's almost fuel to go back and try again, isn't it? And and yeah. patch up whatever that was, whatever that area was that let you down. And sometimes it's just literally the style of the other fighter, isn't it? If it's a fight, you know, it's not like that's, yeah, just souls match. Like um, you could lose to someone but then beat someone that really beats that you know like you just kind of just styles make fights it's just that's what obviously um fighting's never 100 percent certain as, as such where it's not the outcome's never going you can't really guess the outcome 100 percent all the time because there's so many variables that can happen that's obviously yeah. what makes it so interesting for people i think that, yeah to, for, for someone who's not really fought who's just watching fighters they're just doing that whole well, that person beat that person. Therefore, the winner of that would beat this person. And you, yeah. like you say, you just can't because the the styles, if someone's style messes up the other person, that's it, isn't it? If, if they can't find oh, a way around yeah. it, if they're not adaptable enough, that's the job done. And it's like some of the comments that I'll get on some of my posts on social media. It's like they're just crazy by a lot of people that don't really fully understand what they're they're looking at. Yeah. <laughs> there, there's some there's some funny comments isn't there yeah. what's, what's your what's the, the the most common one that you tend to get then uh the most common one is that wouldn't work in a real fight you should have a real fight and you'll kind of know so all right then or do the ones the bag doesn't hit back and obviously i've got that quite a lot recently and it's kind of a strange comment because one obviously bag work is quite important and two, we're in a lockdown, so you can't do any other training than hit the bag. So I don't really know what people are expecting. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's a hell of a tool. I mean, I personally found that I did a lot of my own self-development on a punch bag by myself, you know, outside of classes, because I didn't have a full-time gym that I was able to train at. So I was doing stuff at home. This, this is back in the day. And I came away from those punch bag sessions really having learned something, you know, put, putting together some sort of combination that really worked nicely for me. And then next time I was sparring, I just try it out and there'd be this little filter process of, oh yeah, works on the bag, but not on a person, not quite the right shape or, or footwork pattern around them. That's not how they react. Yeah. Um, but there, there's certainly loads you can take from, from uh, heavy bag work, isn't there? So the, um, the, the, the one gym that I was at in Thailand, like uh, their rounds were 10 minute rounds. So it was like, it was hard going. So if you were competing, you used to have to do two to three rounds on the pads, which wasn't very nice. But then obviously from there, you go to the bag for same game, three to four rounds. So that could be 40 minutes on a bag. It's, it's mind numbing. But you kind of, um, you, you learn how to use the bag properly. Like you figure out what works. And it also, like for me, it kind of, I found out a little bit more about myself and my body and how my body, how I can conserve energy, when to let it go, when to, you just kind of made things a little bit different. Yeah. It just wasn't enjoyable. <laughs> it's just an enduring event though. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, in Thailand, it's just a little bit different where it's just kind of, it's almost hard, 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 hard all the time. Yeah. And, and quite literally hard. Some of those bags as well. I, I remember yeah. the first time I went to Thailand, I, I saw a little junior. I was, I was stuck on the truck tires doing the warm up, just stand there with the hand weights, just having to go into waiting for a coach to kind of, pick yeah. me off of there to do some pad work and um or, or to send me onto the bags and there was a a, a kid had finished school so in the afternoon session come in he was smashing this bag and then i was said told you go on the bag so i went on the bag and i thought right I'll, I'll kick this bag now and i kicked it and whoa that was a hard bag that was really really solid you know i just felt my shin everything just reverberated yeah. and that was so different from anything i experienced back in the uk i mean obviously things have changed people have got sort of different densities of bag and all this kind of stuff now and yeah. i know your your gym you're kind of like the cereal bag collector aren't you you've got lots yeah, of it's different, quite a few different ones in there <laughs> so you've got I'm, I'm assuming sort of different different bags for different kind of drills and jobs and things because of the way you think yeah. about things can you sort of tell, talk me through what you've got and why um obviously i've got a lot of them the, the I've got a few light bags that are quite long, mainly because when people first come in, they would want to come in. They don't want to get hurt when they're training, so I didn't go on them bags. I've got a couple of other bags, again, that are quite long, but they're quite solid. So that's more just like conditioning shins. Then I've got the heavy bags for you to obviously work on power 
So I've also got like the pole bag, which everyone kind of talks about. And I've just got this other bag that's like bigger than the pole bag. Should be the same again, like for power. So obviously you're getting used to like a, a heavy weight, it doesn't really move. So you can really obviously throw your shots into it. And I've got a couple of uh, tire bags. People think that they're quite hard, but they're not. When you hit them, they kind of bounce off. So they move quite right. a lot. So you have to kind of move with them. And obviously it's, it's quite soft on your hands, to be honest, as well. So obviously there's a lot of give yeah. behind it. And I've got uh, an aqua bag, which same again, it, it's, it's quite soft when you hit it. But obviously it's heavy at the same time. So it can work on your power. Um, and I've got the Boxmaster, which is the thing that's like a drum kit. All the bits all over it. Which again, that's just like for drill work, just combination drills. Yeah, and those those combinations you've got are so well thought out. I, I really like the fact, you know, they're, they're quite often longer combinations, aren't they? But like you say, you've set shots up. So some shots you're expecting to, to actually pay dividends. Other ones are sort of setups. And some are like, well, if this worked, then this won't. And if this part of the combination worked, then this bit's probably gone defunct. And it's very well thought out. Yeah, but as well, when people think like, because um, again, one of the comments that I get is that's too long, that'll never work in a real fight, which obviously they're not, I don't think they've read the post of what it's all about. They've just looked at the video. But say there's, they've done like a 12 hit combination. I'm never going to land 12 hits on someone unless they're really stupid. But obviously the idea is to get used to throwing in volumes. If I throw 12 in a fight, I'll probably throw four or five, you know, like it's just kind of working on that aspect. But then if you watch how the combination is thrown, it's not 12 straight strikes. It's a three to two, it's a four. So there's small combinations added into one. And those split seconds gives you that chance to have a look how they've reacted what you can throw from there, you know, like you can move if you have to, if they're going to attack back, it, it kind of just breaks the rhythm up slightly. Yeah. And I've said the same again, where if you kind of go one, two, stop, one, two, three, it kind of it throws them off at the same time as well, defending. It's interesting because it, there's a, a way that I like to work on the pads. It kind of sounds similar to, to the way you structure things there. Almost, I refer to it as like chunking, where there, there are sort of set combination pieces but then there's this, what I refer to as like an observation period where you, you are seeing what is the effect of what you've just done. And then almost like the next chunk happens based on whatever's happened, however they've reacted, however they've moved, what the distance become. But if you've drilled these things so that they become automatic, you, you start, like we spoke about earlier, you start to flow, don't you, in between different things. So it's almost like, well, I didn't yeah. get through that whole sequence. There's an interruption here, but I've immediately just rebounded off because my brain's picked up my visual cues. This has happened. Yeah. This one's on. And you kind of go into it without even thinking. Because as well, um, our gym as well, we just, it makes it easier for the gym in general just for people to work on combinations. But we have combinations by numbers. So each number might have three or four shots tied to that number. And obviously, one, it makes it easy for everyone knows how to hold the pads because they know how, what, what to do rather than trying to figure out a combination. But also uh, for the competing side of things, it makes it easier because your brain, I think, can only take, um, I think it's three or four bits of information at one time to, to process. So if I've got three combinations, I've got four or five techniques to, to each one, do two, four, six, it's only three bits of information, but you know what they are. So you can incorporate a bigger strike, if that makes sense. Yeah, so definitely. I get some people that they'll kind of take the mic out of the number of combinations, but again, there's a system behind it. You got to understand what the system is to really benefit from it. Yeah, it's it's kind of filtering down the brain workload, isn't it? Because we yeah. know a load of that's going to go in the fight, and if we can Not just that, obviously, um, obviously, like Muay Thai is two minutes in between rounds, but obviously a lot of other places. And when you get on the big promotions as well, now you have got a minute, so you've got a minute to relay information to someone. And if you start going, oh, when he comes in, go jab, cross, step off, step to. It's just too much. You you've just got to do two, three, step here, four. You know, like it's just very, very quick. And obviously yeah. they can process that very easily while they're getting the water, while they're getting the breath back. And I've, I've definitely personally seen that with coaches in between rounds, kind of just bombarding the fighter with instructions and, and very sort of technical, discreet instructions. You're just thinking, that's really not helping at all. That's, that's just yeah. going to overload. That, those two or three bits of information, like you say, and then go out and test for that round with that. And we'll come back and and reestablish game plan if we need to, depending on what's happened then. That's yeah. really interesting that you you kind of work that way. That's, yeah, good stuff. 
<laughs> there's a lot of kind of re research that's that's done on um, that sort of cognitive ability and and how many instructions you can take on especially when the stress levels are raised and depending on what your heart rate is so if you're if you're kind of fitter and you can get your heart rate down to a, 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 a well below typically 80 percent then you're much able to kind of process things again um so it's, it's kind of understanding where you are on that sort of scale as well so yeah, well just like that depends on how the round's gone because like um, i've had people that have kind of they've lost that round badly and they've come back to the corner and they're just not registering anything so you have to kind of bring them around quickly to so they're paying attention to you at the same time so obviously there's so many different factors that people don't kind of take into account there, there's personalities involved as well isn't there yeah that's, and it like you were saying earlier about knowing the fighter that's where as a, a corner person that's you you really earn your money there not just tactically but you've got to work with a person haven't you yeah, I, I don't know if um, I watched the um, documentary, uh, I think it was The Last Dance, uh, about the Chicago Bulls and Michael Jordan. Yes. And it's like if you watch that, obviously you've got Michael Jordan, who was, he trained, he was disciplined, and obviously he's obviously one of the greatest players of all time. Then you had Dennis Rodman, who again was a fantastic, but he's completely the other side of the spectrum. But they were both extremely successful, but they just dealt with it differently, which is what I was saying. That obviously, with your fighters, you don't know what they're like until after a couple of fights then you kind of know how like, this person i need to be like this with that person i need to be like that you know you can kind of work it out that way you need to kind of know what makes them tick yeah that's fascinating stuff i mean it's the 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 individual in front of you and those the sort of emotional responses you can or can't get that really triggers it really triggers one way or the other and being yeah. sensitive to that um because like you'll get some fighters where um you need to tell them look you're losing you need to do this you need to do that but then there's other people if you start going that way they'll kind of go down they'll get worse because it's all negative so you need to go oh, look you're doing well but you need to be able to push this unit so you need to know how to talk to the individual in front of you yeah I've, I've actually had a fighter before where i was cornering and um i was saying like you're losing you got to and he was like oh, i won that round <laughs> and it, it yeah. didn't want to change anything just went out and did the same thing again and it's it's fascinating to me how people can have that a uh, viewpoint and they're so stuck in it that they're they're not willing to kind of accept yeah that, there, that anything else is happening than, than what they believe um which of course it just means you're, you're you're not able to adapt you're not able to actually respond to the instructions and uh, I'm, I'm not really sure where that comes from i've never got to the bottom of that uh, I, I don't know i don't know if it's just um that probably comes from childhood or something you know like from some way way back and that's just that's just them i don't yeah. know you're just gonna be bouncing off there's no there's no point yeah the adrenaline's on i yeah <laughs> in in terms of like obstacles like that sort of person there but you know as as a fighter and a coach really what are the greatest lessons you've learned from sort of struggles and obstacles you've had what what were those sort of biggest obstacles do you feel and, and what did you learn from them uh i had um there's in the early 2000s i kept breaking my hand like every fight i'd break my hand it'd be the same bone as well so it I was at a point where i thought if it breaks again i'll, I'll retire and obviously luckily it didn't we did everything that was we needed to kind of get my hand going again so obviously i kind of carried on but it's like from there it could have been quite easy for me to just go you know what just forget it and it's kind of step off. So literally, it's like I was talking about before. It's that um, I'm goal driven. So if I've got a goal, I'll keep going until I get to that goal. So obviously, from there, that kind of helped. I want. I still haven't got to where I want to be. So I kind of push through. And that's just perseverance. Yeah. So that that's that's kind of like the underpinning for you is is finding as long as you've set yourself a, an appropriate goal that's that you're going for then you're able to kind of, kind of keep on track. Yeah, I think that's probably another reason why I'm just not interested in the slightest in competing anymore. Like I don't miss it or anything, but I think it's because I'm goal driven and because of my age, I can't do anything in the sport now. I'd just be fighting for the sake of fighting. It just doesn't interest me. I'm not money motivated. I'm not, it's just, it's just nothing there for me kind of thing. So I'm just kind of happy with how things are. And it's, it's not like you haven't achieved things with your fighting no, already but, you know like, like, like you, you come off or oh, I'd, I'd like I, I still wanted to do this or i still wanted to it's just i don't have the time frame to be able to to do it so i'm just it just doesn't interest me in the slightest 
But how has your preparation from like when you were a novice, how has it changed from then to now or, or how you train, how you prepare fighters now? Uh, it's, it's, it's really hard because being obviously in Thailand, it's, it's twice a day. It's every day. Um, I kind of learned that you don't have to go full out all the time. So you can kind of have like a, a hard one, more of a technical one, probably a hard one again. You know, if you need it, you know, I just kind of break it up slightly. But um, because people have got jobs and they've got families, it's just really hard to to push people in the right direction. I can only do with them the time that they allow me to do anything with them, if that makes sense. It's just really, really difficult. Um, I'll get like a few guys that I go to strength conditioning coaches as well. Um, I make sure that I talk to them just to let them know, look, I still want them to be able to do this. So don't kind of do anything that's going to mess that up. And, and obviously we can kind of converse that way. And it, it's been working quite well. Yeah. That you definitely need, if you've got other people handling bits and pieces, it need to be knowing where you are in different in for the, the fight camp, for example, you yeah. know, if it is a competitive fighter. You can certainly get that all wrong. If you're not aware of the timing and doing the wrong thing at the wrong time. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> in, in terms of that, um, how many times typically do you find um, fighters during the week are going out and doing sort of any kind of supplemental training that's not what you're you're giving them? Most go uh, about like twice a week, and obviously because like for me with the strength conditioning, the strength conditioning should be to aid the sport that you're doing. It shouldn't overtake the sport that you're doing, which I think a, a lot of people kind of get confused. And obviously, like now, there's more people doing strength conditioning three to four times a week, and not the sport that they're supposedly uh, contesting in yeah and that that's interesting that you've got that sort of two times a week that's exactly what what i recommend for people as well that if you're if you're doing a good well-structured session then twice a week is enough to hit all of the aspects that you're going to be under developing from from just doing the the muay thai alone so that's plenty and it's not not taking you away from your actual skilled sport which is the important bit um, I think I put a comment on your post before where um, in Thailand, and I was training from six in the morning till nine in the morning, and then it's from three till six. And after a couple of days, I was I was burnt out and I just had to have a rest. And obviously I had a rest, come back to the gym the next day. They asked me, oh, where was you yesterday? So I was tired, needed a break. No one spoke to me for two weeks. Mm. Like I'd literally come to the gym, no one would say hello. No one would just kind of hold pads, not really say anything to me. He took two twice a day again for him to start doing anything. Yeah. But I think rest is just as important as the actual training. Yeah. I've, I've got this, um, there's, there's stimulus, which is the training and then adaptation. And that's your body adapting to the training and getting better. And um, there, are, there are certain people that I say to them, you're all stimulus and no adaptation because they just want to push, 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 push. And then don't actually respect that they're falling over as a result not getting better you know what's really funny is like with you saying that is i found i could improve more after i got back from thailand because i could practice what they were doing with me when i got back so obviously they were just too good for me to throw over there in training and stuff but obviously when i got back i could kind of understand what they were trying to get me to do does that make sense well i don't know if that's because the training was just hard all the time like for a stage i was fighting every 10 days so it was literally fight rest train be really hard and i think that's probably what it was i just couldn't sit down and kind of process what i'd been doing yeah and th there's there's this whole bit as well i mean depending on what the timing was afterwards if you've kind of pushed that hard that you've really broken yourself down there's like this um well, super compensation, it's called, where if you allow that period of rest, you actually shoot up. Basically, you've got fatigue is masking what your fitness is. So once you rest, the fitness um, doesn't drop off as quick as the fatigue does. So you, the fatigue drops away quickly and you're then left with what fitness you've still got. So everyone kind of panics a bit like, oh, I haven't done any training. Okay. Um, but it's like that, that sort of training residual hangs around a lot longer than the fatigue does. So just just chill out a bit, <laughs> let the fatigue drop down, and then we'll we'll actually sh be able to de demonstrate then exactly what you've got underneath there that's been masked by fatigue. Um, and it, that's part of the, the planning training, actually, just 
deciding when it's time to push and when it's time to back off and timing that for, for a fight effectively? Because as I got towards like the end of my career, um, it would get to a stage where I think, I think I need a rest today. And I'd, I'd take a rest because I think I'm, I'm a bit burnt out. So I'll chill out. And I was in, so I kind of, as I got older, I kind of understood my body a little bit more. I kind of knew when to come off the gas, if that makes sense. Yeah, that's that's really interesting as well. The, the, the fact that there's that sort of self-awareness and that comes with the experience of training and knowing when, oh, actually, yeah, I'm kind of tipping over the edge here. Is that one of the things that, you know, if you could go back in time that you would change earlier on, that you'd sort of manage manage that? Or is there something else that you would perhaps change in your approach to training since yeah, you I, I think that there's been some fights where I've overtrained, like I may have trained because too long for it. Because obviously when you're younger, you kind of just fight, 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 fight. But as you kind of get more experience, you get bigger fights, but less of them. So you, you do get the... 10 to 8 to 6 weeks prior to a fight to kind of prepare and obviously I think some of them I might have gone too long where I kind of overtrained for it when um, I feel like when I've overtrained I haven't been able to push in the fight if that makes sense it's really hard to kind of go that a little bit more so I'd, yeah. I'd probably step off the gas a little bit on on some of the fights so I don't think and because um, I don't smoke I don't drink I don't really eat massively unhealthy so I don't need long, vigorous camps to prepare. Like um, I can get relatively fit in four weeks because I don't abuse my body, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. And when you do go into training, you're doing the right stuff, aren't you? Rather than just sort of yeah. chucking loads of volume of anything and everything, you're like, I need, I know I need to do this, this, and this. It's kind of like yeah. the, the essentials checklist. That's going to get you ready for the fight and cut off all the other stuff that's that's one of the big things i find as well that that whole that sort of pareto rule the 80 20 rule with the 20 percent of the of the vital things that make the 80 percent of your performance and the remaining 80 percent of what you do is actually only giving you a 20 percent improvement in your performance so a lot yeah. of people i think spend too long with their their pin in the training camp that's the 80 percent of that's non-essential really it's 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 not going to be moving you forward it's it's a lot of time invested for not a lot of return. Whereas that 20% yeah. is the magic. And I think that's potentially, well, it should be something that as you get more experienced, you start to hone in on what is the 20%. You kind of find them out, don't you, as you go along. Cause like now, uh, if I, for me to train, it might sound silly, but I have to train to be able to train. If that makes sense. Cause I haven't done such a long time after to slowly get moving for like a couple of weeks then I can start training a little bit harder. But so I have to kind of get my body prepared to train, if that makes sense. Yeah. And strange as you get older. <laughs> it's, it changes, doesn't it? I mean, that's, yeah. that's something I'm kind of finding. It's something I'm massively researching, actually, what happens to the body as you get older, what are the qualities that diminish the quickest so that we can make sure we keep on top of those. Um, it's, uh, but do you know what? The, and the end result is, in terms of like strength and conditioning, it is really train like a fighter. It's all the concurrent training stuff. So it's all strength, power, and speed. There, these are all the things you need to keep that will kind of naturally degrade as you get older. But it's also like we were talking about earlier the the kind of strength around the joints, keeping that all nice and balanced. Yeah. So the the muscular system are do, is doing the job rather than the the bones themselves. But um, I mean, you're you're a fighter that leads by example as well. So how important is that? You know, to keep yourself now that you're not fighting. In, in a position where you're able to demonstrate all the stuff you you, you want to be um, able to I do? It's, I, I think it's massively important. That's why um, I still try to make sure that I still move around a little bit because every now and again, so I might fall off and not do anything for a while. And when I have to demonstrate something, it's a little bit hard. And what I remember, I thought, oh, it doesn't look good for the students if I can't pull off what I'm asking them to do. So I have to kind of get back into training again so I can still move around. Um, and as well, as like um, when we touched on it earlier, uh, people learn differently. Some people are very visual. They need to see what you're explaining rather than you telling them. So I need to make sure that I can demonstrate it for those people so they can look at it and kind of pick it up from there. Because I'm one of those people, I'm very visual. Like if you tell me to do something, I'd have to say, oh, can you show me? And obviously once you show me, I can kind of do it from there. Yeah. I, I guess it's going to be the, um, the, the, the feeling people at the moment are going to be struggling because they can't. Yeah because of the whole COVID yeah, thing. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. You can't physically put them in positions or get them to feel it necessarily quite yeah. the same way. You can't. Yeah. 
yeah the visual the visuals are kind of winning at the moment <laughs> <laughs> i guess you know like like myself at least you've got something going on with online as well haven't you i mean it's mainly through yeah. the worry collective isn't it is that the, is that something that's sort of working for you at the moment yeah it is um it's kind of um it's kind of helped the gym as well because obviously people mm. that are into martial arts they'll kind of come across the warrior collective and they come across me they'll yeah i see that i'm in the area and then obviously they'll kind of come over that way and i'll get people from abroad as well message me and i want to come and like train at the gym for a couple of weeks yeah it's kind of cool as well it's it seems crazy doesn't it that i mean for me because i've been in muay thai for a while I'm I'm fully aware of who you are and what you've done all the rest of it, but there's there's this sort of continuous sort of um, new new level coming in, and they they don't know the history so much, even in the UK Muay Thai, and it, it seems to me it's like oh, people are finding you from Warrior Collective is like if they're into Muay Thai, they should know who you are really. It seems crazy. It's mad because a lot from from my era. There was like some great fighters from from back then. No one knows who they are at all now which is kind of a shame but obviously the internet wasn't around then obviously a lot of their footage isn't about do you know what that i was just just going to say that because i mean you've still got a lot of stuff that you're able to share that that you had recorded and i think actually from from back in those sort of a little bit earlier times there was less of that going on and there was more shows that were like um we've got rights to this footage no one else can film anything i guess the phones weren't around so there just wasn't footage to that extent but i think you've done really well to i guess because you had some higher level fights there you had some footage that, available well, then, um, uh, my coach steve logan um he used to be a professional wrestler so oh, that's right he's got a lot of yeah so he's got obviously he always used to say to us look make sure you get your photos make sure you get your videos make sure you get these because i've lost so much stuff when i was younger and i really regret it now so obviously like now i like there's still a lot of stuff that um, I haven't been able to get hold of because I think if you remember there used to be um, a martial arts magazine called Combat. Oh yeah, yeah. They've got hundreds and hundreds of pictures of me, but obviously that was pre-digital. And I've tried to track them down. I've said, oh yeah, we'll sort them out for you, but I'm guessing they've just been binned because obviously they've moved offices from where they were. So I'm guessing they've just they're just lost. But I've got the magazines that I was in, but obviously just not the actual pictures. <laughs> magazines uh I've, i moved house um about a year ago and i had boxes full of magazines all the old combats and martial yeah. arts illustrated and all these kind of these uh i guess before there were sort of mma magazines and that there were all these sort of combat was kind of like the universal one wasn't it that pulled all the, no, it, the yeah. full contact people together otherwise it yeah. was all like traditional karate and taekwondo and stuff like that if you were to give like one piece of advice to to help someone to, to be the best they can be what do you think that would be um it depends on uh do you mean training wise or if they're wanting to become a champion a- anything whatever kind of crops crops up in your mind there from your experience See, like, now what i keep seeing as again we spoke about it briefly um there's like this fad now of people that need to have an eight week bike camp to get ready for a fight i think when you're starting out don't train hard all the time we should be consistently training that's obviously how you're improving and you should be ready to take a fight at a week to two weeks notice because that's when you're going to get your experience. That's when you're going to kind of start climbing up the ranks. You're not If you're only giving yourself eight weeks, you're only going to get a certain number of fights that year. So you're going to be slowly holding yourself back. Obviously, if the fight's hard and you're a bit injured, don't take a fight in two weeks. But if oh, there's a fight for you against so-and-so, do you want to do it? Yeah, I wanted to, cause I, I used to jump, but yeah, I'll fight. That's why I fought. I fought from, I was, I fought from fifty-two kilos up to sixty-three kilos just to get fights, and I was still small. Like obviously, before fifty-two, I'd have to come down to fifty-two, but I naturally just walked around at like fifty-seven, uh, fifty-eight. But we just yell, yeah, fight, yell, yeah, fight, yell, yeah, fight, yell, yeah, fight. Sometimes it paid off. Sometimes it didn't. But obviously, it just kind of, it got my experience. It got obviously my reputation. It's just fighters now they just need to keep pushing and that's when they're going to get to the top they don't need to know what breakfast your opponent had the day before and they don't need to just fight (laughs) so you definitely feel there's there's almost like a a frequency shift in in terms of the the periods between fights when you're sort of starting out you're doing more frequent fights and it and it sort of evolves into you having longer gaps between fights yeah um i didn't really think of it until but um i went to train um, at uh, Roman Decker's gym when I was 18 and I was talking to like, his coach Cor 
And I was talking to him and he, and he was kind of saying, look, when you're young, you can have 20 fights a year. I thought that was a bit excessive, but 20 fights a year. Because but then as you get older, could you have bigger fights, more important fights? And obviously, when I've kind of looked at my own career and how it's progressed, I haven't thought about it, but that's how it's happened. Like you fight regular, regular, regular. And as the fights get bigger, they'll just get less and less. But they're more important fights. And again, you can look at it in boxing. You'll see people box. Maybe, I think Tyson, when he first started out, I'm sure he was fighting almost every month. But then obviously, as he got to become champion, there were like two fights a year, maybe three fights a year. You know, like you just kind of, it's just how it is. Because obviously, one, obviously, money factor, because the promoter's got to find his money to pay the fighters. But it's just, you can't keep fighting hard all the time like that. Obviously, they do in Thailand, but it's just a bit of a different uh, viewpoint. Yeah, the, the, there's different incentives there, isn't there? I mean, yeah. that is their livelihood. Whereas here, we're we're doing it because it's something we enjoy doing. Weirdly, yeah. <laughs> For me, that frequency between fights is is a um, how I kind of base the principle on this one is what is going to improve the fighter the most. So early on, actually, experience is the thing that moves them forward the most. As a there's a like a crossover point where actually now it's having enough time between fights to change something that they're doing before they go out and just repeat the same mistake again. I mean, obviously styles and fights and all the rest of it, but whatever you've learned from that last fight, however it went, win or lose, whatever, for me, there's always like a shopping list of, right, this, this bit went really well. These were the bits, these were exposed a little bit. We need to work on those before the next fight and then go out and test again. And sometimes that frequency is, is completely different. Sometimes it's like you could go out and change this in a week and you're not injured or sometimes it's like you need four to six weeks eight weeks or whatever to drill we've got to change something major here perhaps that's a real habit that we need to reinforce in a different way and actually it's not going to serve you too well to go out too early now no yeah no i agree with that it um, obviously depends on how that fight was performed on the fight beforehand like if you've done everything amazingly then yeah another fight comes up take it but if, obviously i think that's your job as the coach then to kind of go okay, I won't get him a few fights for a while, so I need to work on this with him. And I've even talked to him. Because most, fight, most fighters, you say, oh, do you want to fight so-and-so? They'll just go, yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's your job then to kind of almost save them from themselves. You, you need to look. As I was saying before, you need to understand the person that's in front of you. And obviously, you might want them to respond in a certain way. So you might need to hold them back or you might need to push them a little bit more. That's why sometimes being a coach is a little bit harder than being a fighter because you just can't see, just go out and compete where the coach has to really sit, sit back and assess what's the best for the individual. In terms of assessment as well, have you ever been big on reviewing sort of fight footage of opponents before you, before you see them? Because I know some coaches do, some coaches don't. Just interested to see what your take is on that. I think it depends on how much footage you can get. Like um, I've, I've had fights where... I've watched the tapes. I've prepared for them. They haven't done what I've prepared for. So it's kind of, I don't have a plan B, you know, like it's just kind of, but then um, sometimes I've watched things and it works amazing. You know, it's just kind of, I think it depends on how many fights of theirs you can get. And then what will happen is generally when you watch them, their fights are very different, but there will be certain tells that they'll do frequently. That's what you've got to look out for. Mm. now it's a little bit easier because everyone likes to put their stuff on youtube well back before you might be lucky to get one or two videos and and that's it kind of thing so it's knowing what to look out for so you might i look every time he jabs he drops that right hand down so we can work on this so every time he before he goes to kick he does a little shuffle you know he, those are the things you need to look at actual um how they kind of fight probably isn't going to work because stars make fights. So you might make them react differently, if that makes sense. Yeah, definitely. I was going to say that, you know, I've, I've seen fighters fight one way against one style fighter and then completely differently because they, well, they've had to, to win that fight. Yeah. They couldn't fight the same way they did then against this person. Yeah. And that's that adaptable fighter that can actually do that. But yeah, it can make a massive difference. I, I like the fact that you're kind of looking for those kind of like, common tells that the kind of the the things that are happening all the time regardless of of um yeah. what styles they're competing against this this is a kind of a common habit that's happening all the time regardless of how they're moving against who they're moving against that's always present there i remember um i was this was years ago and i was, I was i can't remember what it was i was reading on a forum 
and he's talking about um, what's the best attributes that a champion should have. And like I was thinking, like for me, I kind of first thought timing. You could have the worst technique in the world, but if you've got timing, you can finish fights off. But I was reading through the comments and then someone put adaptability and I put because if you're unfit, you got to adapt. If you're technically not very good, you got to adapt. If you're not strong, you got to... And I thought, you know what, that's... That be able to adapt in the fight quickly is what can really change things. And like when you look at some of life, if you look at um, like Sanchai, when he has a competitive fight, someone does something to him once, they can't do it again. You no, know, like he just kind of adapts quickly, so it doesn't. I think that that's a massive thing to to be able to do is be able to change the fight as you go in halfway in. Another great example for us oldies is if you watch. Um, Sugar Ray Leonard against Thomas Hearns, and you kind of watch the fight, how the first half of the fight is um, Hearns stalking Leonard, and then halfway through it switches, and it's completely the opposite way around. So obviously the fight adapt, like Leonard was able to adapt to change it to what he needed to do. Yeah. And in the training, with the, the adaptability, so, you know, sort of habits coming out really from what you're repeating the most is going to happen in the ring. Um, is there anything now on reflection, you might not have even thought about it before, that you have in your training that changes the environment to force people to be adaptable is is that something you're you're finding is working in, in as a bit of a thread in how you're training fighters uh, I, just, I think it's hard i think it depends on the individual and obviously experience is a huge one but i think it depends on the individual because like you'll get some fighters like um say bovi i don't know if people remember who bovi was he's not going to adapt he's just going to come forwards like he's going to fight but he was very successful so i think it just depends but then like i say you look at someone like sanchai he's very adaptable he can switch he can change it up he can get aggressive if he needs to so you can't make everybody the same so someone who's not um someone who can adapt i'd probably say is extremely a clever fighter some fighters just aren't clever yeah. as such not, not that they're stupid but you know like their style is aggression so it's going to be you can't make if you try and change them they're gonna they're gonna lose yeah like i remember years and years and years ago i was actually only talking about this um yesterday there was um a fight from the midlands called paul fisher and he used to think he was prince Nassim. so like he he danced around like he, he kind of beat some really good people by this real awkward style but then um he fought for the british title against like from uh, dave parkinson from sword chanas and he lost but after that fight he tried to go back to nor like what we'd consider normal and it, it just didn't work for him because they tried to change him if that makes sense so i just it just didn't work for him so i think if you try and change an aggressive fight someone who's trying to be too clever or vice versa it's just not gonna work with them again you have to know who you're dealing with yeah but, and do you know it's interesting i'm going to put something together about how the physical attributes kind of affect your fight style as well you know so so someone who is naturally stronger and more powerful tends to have that more um aggressive come forward attitude sort of a fighter that's that's perhaps less strong typically than their opponents has learned that being evasive and elusive um, mm. and tricky, that that kind of gets the job done for them. And the, the the physical qualities obviously underpin what your style is. And that if you're yeah. if you're training a certain way, you can train to kind of double down on your your strengths as such. Not necessarily strength being the 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 real word here, but um, almost like a pun. But you're um, you, you're also minimizing the weaknesses if you need to, but you don't want, don't want to sort of spend too much time doing that because it's like you say, it's not, it's not appropriate for you. You need to make sure you're not completely dead in the water in that, Yeah. but wasting too much time on that is not the reason you're winning. That, that actually yeah. finding out that this, this guy is the, uh, you know, is unorthodox movement is the bit that catches people out and taking that away from him just yeah. left him exposed. And that's probably exactly how he felt. So you were saying then, like the, the way kind of people are built, if you kind of look at, not all, but most, if you look uh, at any of the combat sports, it's normally the shorter, stockier people, that are the big punchers, because obviously they've got a lot of leverage with their legs to be able to kind of deliver the punch a little bit more. It's not often you'll get someone who's very tall. Thomas Hearns was, but it's not often you'll get someone who's very tall that are very 
very big punches just because of that exactly what you've just said there like depend on how your body shaped would depend on your style yeah there's those natural attributes isn't there both physically and mentally and psychologically emotionally all that kind of stuff all kind of comes together and that's your style and that's what you should go with and it's it's really good when you've got yeah. a coach that recognizes that rather than that whole kind of cookie cutter this is the way we fight in our gym um you fit the mold or that's it well I, we've gone way over time there mate i'm sorry if i've held on to you too long there i'm gonna <laughs> i'm gonna let you no, get away <laughs> but no thanks Thanks for taking the, the time here to, to have a chat with us. You shared some really great stuff. And um, oh, no, thanks for that. Hopefully speak to you again sometime, mate. Okay. And take care. Bye-bye. You can find Damien Trainer's work through the Warrior Collective and also, of course, at his K-Star Legacy Gym. And there's links with this episode. And if you found this valuable, please like, subscribe, and share this with someone else that it could help too. And I'll catch you next time.